Okay, so welcome to chapter two. Chapter two begins the first of two chapters that are considered foundational chapters um, for learning anatomy and physiology. Uh, and chapter two is basic chemistry. Uh, the other chapter is chapter three, which obviously we'll get to after this chapter, so that'll be next week. Um, the thing is about these two foundational chapters is, is I, I want you to be sure that you spend enough time in them to try to get a better understanding of what it is that we're talking about in these chapters. Uh, we're going to build on these, so don't think that you have to understand these and know these perfectly uh, because we're going to talk about them a little bit more, but, uh, and you'll always be able to reference back to them. So try to spend some time, though, understanding this as best you can. This chapter two, the good news is, is most of you guys have seen this stuff before. Uh, for those of you guys that's been out of high school for a while, uh, it, it should come back to you. It might be a little bit slow. Uh, but you'll remember a lot of this stuff, and for those of you guys that just recently out of high school, uh, a lot of this stuff won't be much new, um, but there will be some concepts and some things kind of later on in this uh, that will be new to you, so uh, don't, don't just gloss over it and think you know all about it, uh, because we are applying this basic chemistry to, to anatomy and, uh, and not to a chemistry class. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, basically... Uh, uh, the things that we're going to talk about at first, of course, are matter and energy. Uh, and, of course, matter is anything that occupies space and has a mass weight. Um, that's what, it, in order for something to be considered matter, that's what it has to have. Um, think about it this way. Um, here where we're at on the planet Earth at sea level, everything around us has matter or is considered matter because it has mass and takes up space. Even the air that we're breathing um, and the air that is surrounding us has a certain amount of mass um, because of all the elements and things that are in the air that we're breathing, like oxygen and nitrogen and all those types of things. They take up space, so they're considered matter. Um, that's in part is what gives us our atmosphere as well. It gives us the atmospheric pressure. It's all of those molecules pushing down from the... Uh, um, from the very far reaches of our atmosphere, from the very top of our atmosphere, just before you get to outer space, the combined weight of all those molecules pushing down is what actually gives us the 14.7, I think, PSI, pounds per square inch of, uh, of pressure that's exerted on our bodies. So there's matter all around us, even in the air. If we go outside of our atmosphere, there's no matter in the air, in that in that empty space. They call it a vacuum of space because there's no matter there. There's no oxygen. None of those molecules or anything like that are present there. So absent all of that, there's no pressure. There's no weight from that. So we wouldn't survive in space because we wouldn't have all the nutrients as part of it, but we also wouldn't have the pressure or the weight that we're normally used to here at sea level um, uh, on planet Earth. Um, so matter also exists in one of three states. This shouldn't be anything new. Solids, liquids and gases. Um, those are the three states that we typically find matter in, or that we will find matter in. Um, and depending on what that what that particular thing is, is uh, will determine, you know, what its state's going to be. Uh, matter can be changed. There are times when matter can be changed. We can physically change it, but when we physically change it, it doesn't necessarily alter the basic nature of a particular substance or a particular piece of matter. Chemical changes, however, um, do happen to alter that composition of a substance. So there's two types of changes, physical and chemical changes. Um, physically, we, it doesn't really alter the nature of it, but chemically does alter the nature of that particular substance. So um, energy, of course, energy is that ability to do work. Energy is not considered matter because it doesn't take up space. Um, and energy is not necessarily one of those things that you can see, but you kind of can, but we won't get too far into that. Um, so energy, um, there's two different types of energy that we're going to focus on is kinetic and potential energy. Um, kinetic energy is that energy that's actually doing work. So if I'm pushing a chair across the room, um, that would be an example of kinetic energy. If I t take a mouse trap and I set it to catch a mouse, if I push, you know, lift the spring back and I've got this mouse trap set, that is what, what's considered potential energy. The interesting thing about potential energy, it usually takes, well, it always takes energy to create the potential for energy. So we have to use energy in order to store energy. 
So some of the energy that we store is actually lost in the process of storing it um, because it takes energy to actually store it. Um, now, I say it's lost. Um, energy is really not created or destroyed. It's only changed. Um, where I say that the energy is lost when we're storing that or if the energy that we're actually using to move an object, um, it's not necessarily lost. In humans, what we see that energy is changed into another form, and it's usually heat. Um, that energy is, when, when, we, when we store it, sometimes when we use it, it is changed to a, a heat form. Um, and that's something that our body has to deal with, and, and, um, and we have to figure out a way so that the heat doesn't um, get too high within our bodies, which is, I believe, chapter three or chapter four that we'll talk about the integumentary system and how that helps regulate body temperature. But this use of energy in the way that humans use energy and other mammals use energy um, is why we're warm-blooded creatures. Um, it's because of the, uh, the way that we store and use energy and the heat that it creates. Um, and that's where, that is, that's where the energy comes from. Anyway, so uh, there are different forms of energy. There's chemical energy, electrical, mechanical, and radiant energy. Of course, chemical energy is stored in chemical bonds. And the way that we release that energy um, in, you know, from a chemical is to separate those chemical bonds. And in the process of doing that, it releases energy. Not all chemical bonds are going to release energy. There's certain ones that the body utilizes to release energy. Oftentimes when it's releasing that energy, it tries to store it in another form or in another way. Um, electrical energy is from the movement of charged particles. Um, we see this is in a, especially in the nervous system in our, in our bodies and, of course, in the wires and electricity in your house. But this particular type of energy, this electric energy, we're going to talk about that. And this is a, kind of a tough concept, um, so we won't really get into it here. But just realize that it's the movement of charged particles, and when we talk about ions, you know, different ions in the body, cations and anions, it has to do with those, the charging of those particular molecules. Mechanical energy is that energy that directly involves moving matter, whether that's uh, moving the skeleton of our body by the use of muscles, you know, the muscles moving the bones in our body that help us to walk or to stand or to pick up a cup of coffee or something like that. It's mechanical energy. And of course, radiant energy is energy that travels in waves. Probably the best example of that is, you know, the, the energy that's coming from the sun. That's radiant energy. We get heat from that. We can feel the heat um, from those ray, waves of radiant energy. Um, also, there's, uh, you know, we talk about radiant energy. Of course, there's always the, the nuclear stuff. Uh, the radioactive stuff, that kind of thing, but it's that energy that's traveling out in waves. So that's the different types of energy. Um, what The way that our body utilizes energy, <clears throat> excuse me, and one of the things that it does, it wants to convert, convert energy into a form that the body can not only use, but it can store energy for future needs. The way that the body primarily does that is through ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Basically, it traps the chemical energy that is, that is in foods when those, when those uh, chemical bonds are broken. Um, it traps that energy in the form of ATP. And ATP is kind of like the mousetrap um, where it's kind of storing up that energy until it's needed later. Um, we'll get, there's a later discussion. We'll talk about ATP a little bit more in this chapter. Um, but later on in, in, a, in a few chapters down, um, when we talk about cellular respirations and those types of things, we'll talk a, a lot more about ATP. But by the time we get to that chapter, you'll have a pretty good knowledge of what ATP is. Um, and then we'll talk more about how ATP is created, where it's stored, and how it's used, and those types of things. I believe in the chapter on muscles, we'll talk a lot about ATP and how it's used and how it's utilized in the body because the muscles use a lot of ATP. Okay? Um, all right, so... Uh, there's uh, some essential elements that we find in the body. 96% of the body is made up of only four elements. Now, I say 96, realize there's another 4% of other things that are found in the body as well. But 96% of what makes us up are from these four elements. Oxygen, carbon, um, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And of course, if we look at the periodic table, we can see a listing of all the different types of elements. And I don't know, there's... 100 and something or something like that. It's uh, um, a little too sciencey for me. Uh, I never got too excited about the periodic table. Um, but there are much more elements than this than what we find in, the, in, the, in our bodies. 
Um, but if we take a look at that, we can see those elements in this in this chart right here. We can see the top four, um, uh, and and you can see the element listed um, on the side over here, where we where we list the elements right here on the side. Um, we can also see the atomic symbol for those elements listed down this row right here, um, and that's pretty simple to understand that oxygen is O, carbon is C. Um, hydrogen is H and nitrogen is N. So, uh, you know, no, no real mysteries there. Realize, though, that, that the, the symbolic, the atomic symbol that's used for these, um, I believe is derived from the Latin term for that, these particular elements that we see over here on this side. So it's, it's the Latin term um, this, that this, is, that this uh, symbol comes from. It's usually the first letter or two of, of a Latin term. Um, so... Uh, don't make fun of me if I misspell something, or make fun of me. It's okay. I'm used to it. I've done it for a long time. I've, I'm, I'm pretty good at misspelling things. Um, so when we're looking at these at uh, atomic symbols, they may not perfectly match what the element is, um, and that can cause a little bit of confusion. So when we go on down the list, uh, remember this was here. Here we were talking about these make, make up 96% of what the human body's made of. Um, here now we're going to talk about the other little less than 4% of what the body is made up of. Of course, we see calcium. We got calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and then we can see their atomic symbols. Calcium makes sense, phosphorus. What, what's this? Potassium here. That's kind of weird. Um, and then sulfur. Um, potassium, it's one of those Latin words that's, uh, that we get potassium from. And like I said, if it's not Latin, it's something else. Uh, it's one of those. Greek or something like that. I'm pretty sure it's Latin because we get a lot of our um, medical terminology words from Latin. Um, but potassium is one of those with the, the Latin word actually starts with a K and that's where we get that atomic symbol from for, for potassium. One of those things that you're just going to have to try to memorize and re realize that K means potassium. Um, uh, and then of course we got sodium. Sodium is another one of those. Um, and remember we're, we're still just talking about this the last three percent or the last four percent all of these as well as these over here are part of that um, these are these are a lot and a lot more trace amounts they're a lot smaller or actually that's this down here sorry these are a whole lot smaller down here in the bottom but sodium is another one of those that the latin word is uh, a nutrient i can't remember the name of it. it's in your book um, uh, but it starts with an Na, and that's why that symbol for that is a little bit different. Iron um, is another one of those that's a little different. Um, that we're, you're just going to have to get used to it. You'll eventually kind of catch on to that. That's not something that you should spend uh, spend the next <laughs> the next few hours of your life on trying to figure out and, and memorize those. That will come to you. That'll be a pretty easy thing. Um, you'll get it. It'll take a few times of going, what did Na mean? And you'll look it up and you'll realize what it is. So. So don't go making flashcards for those or something crazy because you won't need it, um, not right away. Okay, so what's matter made up of? If we go down to the smallest element of matter, um, if you think back to your high school science class or even your elementary school science class, um, they talked about these little bitty things that none of us can see, um, and that's atoms. Um, so the, these atoms are the building blocks of the elements. So these atoms make up what those elements are, um, and atoms of different elements differ from each other. So not all atoms are the same unless they're of the same element. Um, hopefully that's not too much of a surprise to anybody. Um, each, uh, uh, there's an atomic symbol, which is chemical shorthand for each one of these elements. So when we look at that periodic chart, um, we can see an atomic symbol for that particular element that we're looking at or for the different uh, elements. Um, off the, what they used to think about atoms was is that they were indivisible, um, that they couldn't be divided, that they thought that atoms were actually the smallest element ever seen. And what, they, what, what happened was is they built these big atomic colliders or whatever they're called that would smash atoms together or smash them into things. And they discovered that there were actually other parts to an atom other than just the atom. Um, they found these parts that are inside of the atom and, a, and parts that were on the outside of the atom, and they identified those. Um, uh, but at one time, they didn't know what those were. They didn't even know they existed. So the subatomic particles, those small parts that they found, 
Um, some of them that they found that were contained in the nucleus were protons and neutrons. Protons are positively charged, neutrons are, net, are zero charged, they have no charge whatsoever, or neutral, um, as the names imply. Orbiting around that nucleus were electrons that were negatively charged. Um, these are the things that we're going to talk about, um, and it'll seem kind of silly that we're talking about atoms and positive protons and neutrons and electrons and all this kind of stuff in an anatomy class of all things. I know some of you guys are thinking, this is way too much chemistry for an anatomy class. Well, you need to realize that our body is all about chemistry. And once we talk about these things um, and refresh your memory on these things, you'll start to understand why it's important that we revisited this and we talked about this. So basically, um, for the most part, this isn't always absolutely true, but atoms are basically electrically neutral. If an atom's all left to themselves, um, they're electronically neutral, meaning they have the equal number of protons as they do electrons. So the number of protons in their nucleus equals the number of electrons outside of it in a perfect world, okay? Um, because the positive charge of the proton in the middle cancels out the negative charge on the, on the outs, outside of it um, and vice versa. So it makes it neutral. So the positives and negatives cancel each other out. Um, Ions, on the other hand, are atoms that have gained or lost an electron. So, like I say, in a perfect world, electrons are, electro are electrically neutral, meaning they have no positive or negative charge, so they're neutral. So, uh, they all balanced out. But there are situations where um, atoms may either gain or lose an electron, and then when they do that, we call them ions. If they've lost an electron, they're going to become more positively charged. If they've gained an electron, they're going to become more negatively charged. Um, and that's where this term comes from, and we'll call those um, ions. There's two different types of ions. We can break that down into positive and negatively charged ions. A positively charged ion is a ion and negatively charged ions are oh wow wow I missed that all up anyway like I told you about my spelling don't make fun of me <laughs> um, it's like a disability I think I should get a disability check for it if there's more than one vowel um, in a uh, if there's more than two vowels in a word, I usually wind up having some kind of a vowel movement and it messes everything up. So um, I have a heck of a time with spelling, especially with something that has multiple vowels in it. Um, I think I should be able to get a disability for that, but for some reason the government doesn't agree. Uh, so anyway, um, ions that have either lost or gained electrons, um, if it's positively charged, it's cations. If it's negatively charged, it's anion. Okay? Um, and I may have gotten a little bit ahead, but that's okay. Um, so here's the particles of the atoms. Positively charged protons, negatively charged electrons, and then neutrons are neutral. Um, uh, and each one of these, though, has a weight. So if we're trying to figure out how much a particular atom weighs, uh, protons have an AMU or atomic mass unit of one. Uh, neutrons have, the, have an atomic mass unit of one. And these little electrons down here, though they do have a weight to them, but they're like one two or one one two thousandth of a mass unit. So they're they're the uh, they have little effect on the overall weight of a particular um, atom. Why is that important? Um, because and we'll talk about that weight here in just a little bit. But when we look at the planetary model, the typical model of an atom that we're always used to seeing, you know, we've got this little electron up here and we've got a little proton in here and a little neutron in here. Um, this is positive and this is negative. So that's the, when they're talking about the planetary model, that's the model that they're talking about. The one that we're used to seeing in all of our science books as we were growing up. Um, so, and, and what it does is it gives us an idea so we can visually and conceptually understand what uh, the generally what an atom looks like. Don't, you know, try not to think that every single atom is going to look the same and they're all like this and 
you know, that they're all this perfectly planetary look and all that. So um, generally, they kind of are, but not always. Um, here's another example of that. It's that planetary model. Realize these are negative, and these guys right here are positive, and these guys here are neutral. So um, two protons, two neutrons, two electrons. And this is what they consider the planetary model. Um, you know, just a, a way that we can all look at that and, and be looking at the same things and making the same references. Um, uh, the orbital model is a little bit more modern, uh, and it talks about the uh, chemical behavior of atoms. Um, and it, so it goes into a little bit more depth, and it t depicts atoms in a little bit different way. Um, they have a, an electron cloud. Um, instead of the rings like we've seen on the last one, they talk about electron cloud or a haze of negative charge that's on the outside of the nucleus. Okay, so um, it, that seems like, oh my gosh, they're throwing something really different and weird at me. They're not really. You see this up here. This is a cloud. It's showing a cloud. And the reason why they're showing that is what they want us to realize is, while well, these objects here in the middle are relatively stationary, they might be moving around some, this electron that we're used to seeing on the outside of this out here in this little orbit thing is actually moving around in this space so rapidly that it's creating a cloud. It's moving so fast that it's creating this cloud look here and we can't actually see that electron. Where we back up over here, you know, we can see these little electrons here, but we move forward, this we can't see them. They're moving so fast that we can't see them and that's where they're talking about that electron cloud. Um, problem is, is when we're learning about electrons, we don't see an electron there because the doggone thing's moving so fast. So most of the time we use the old style, this old planetary model, so we can talk about those electrons up there, okay? But that's more um, accurate in the way that electrons behave and, the, and they're moving around there. So these electrons um, do help to determine a, a, an atom's chemical behavior. Um, although uh, the planetary model is not one that's used or it's, it's outdated, they call it outdated, but it's the easiest one for us to understand so when we're talking about all of these atoms and things like that today, especially, we're going to mainly be referencing the planetary model just because it's the easiest one for us to learn from and to be able to build upon. So here's three elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Um, so the, the interesting thing about these three elements, we see that uh, hydrogen actually has one little proton in here and one little electron in here but there's no neutron. There's no neutron. Where is that neutron at? Well, not all hydrogen atoms have a neutron. Some of them do, some of them don't. Um, there's actually different types or different forms of hydrogen. We'll talk about those just a little bit. Um, helium over here, it's got two protons, or I'm sorry, yeah, two protons and two electrons, so it's still balanced out, right? And then we get over here to lithium, and all of a sudden it's got two electron or three electrons and three protons, right? But you notice something different about this. In this first shell of lithium, I'm going to try to circle it here. In this first shell of lithium, it's got two electrons, and then it's got this one little electron up here in another outer shell in an outer ring all by itself. Well, that's because the inner ring, there's not enough space. In, in here, there's not enough space in here to accommodate more than two electrons, right? So only two electrons can fit around this, you know, in this, in this area around this nucleus. Um, so if there's more than two, that third or fourth or fifth is going to have to be in the next, next round out, the next shell out, um, because there's space. It's going to actually just have to move out. Um, there's not enough space in this area for more than two, so it kind of gets bumped out a little bit further away. What's that do to it? Remember, because of the distance between here and here, it creates a pretty strong polarity, but as this electron has to be pushed out further and further from the nucleus, it has less magnetism kind of connecting the two, um, and, and, and that'll become That'll become more important later when we talk about it here in just a few minutes. Um, but just realize as those electrons begin to go further and further out from the center, um, 
we start to we start to lose some of the magnetism that the two have. Now this first shell, like I said, will only hold two. This shell out here can hold up to eight. Okay, so it can hold up to eight electrons. Why eight? Well, there's only room for eight. Um, it gets too crowded. This space this gets too crowded once we get more than eight in here. So if we have more than eight, then it's going to have to go out to this shell mm -hmm. out here, right? Um, and then this, this shell out here can actually hold up to like 18 or something like that. Um, but it's actually full when it gets to, when it gets to eight. Now I could be wrong. It could be this one too. Could be, could be full at eight, but it likes to, for some reason, they like the number of eights. They like, you know, concentrically eight fills one of these outer perimeters. This one right here, if we added another electron over here, it would fill that one with two and then any more would have to go to the outside. This likes, this would be filled. We can take up to seven more on this layer right here. So, so you can kind of see a little bit about how these atoms work. Um, and I do like to get a little bit ahead just because it's um, a little bit easier to kind of move on. Okay. So atomic numbers is the equal to the number of protons that an atom contains. So it's going to be unique to each particle of each element. So if it has an atomic number of one, that means it has one proton. If it's two, it has two protons and so on. So that's kind of easy. It basically tells you uh, the number of electrons of an atom as well in general. So if it's got one proton, it's going to have one electron. If it's got two protons, it's going to have two electrons. And then we can kind of start to surmise what it will look like on that planetary model when we're when we start to add electrons and we've got, you know, protons in the middle. We got a couple of electrons and then, or if we've got more than, if we've got say four protons, then we're going to have four electrons. You know, we can kind of start to get an idea of what that model, that particular atom is going to look like when we're using our planetary model. All right. So I told you that hydrogen has some derivatives um, that uh, not all hydrogen are going to be the same. Now look, they've all got one proton and one electron. Proton, electron, proton, electron, right? They've all got one of those. This one has no neutrons, zero neutrons. This one has one neutron. This one has two neutrons. So that makes it different. Now remember, these neutrons, they don't have a charge, so they're neutral. So they don't affect the overall polarity, you know, between the two. They still balance out. Um, so these are still neutrally charged, but we've got these neutrons in the middle. Um, and how do we make sense of that? Well, we can see the notation right here. We have H with a 1 right here on the top. Um, and then we see the 2 because um, the weight of it's different. You know, this is, we're talking about the weight. That's the weight. Um, um, this one actually has a 2 and this one has a 3. Because remember, I told you that each one of these protons and neutrons have an atomic mass unit of one. Um, so that's going to affect this, and that's where this little number comes from. So that'll tell us. We know that because hydrogen, is uh, its atomic number is one, it will only have one proton and one neutron. Um, even if it's a derivative, it's still only going to have one proton and one neutron. I'm sorry, one proton and one electron. But if it has this little two here, then that means there's another neutron. And this here means there's two neutrons. Um, not that that's critically important that you understand, but you need to realize that there are derivatives of each of these of hydrogen, for example. What that derivative is called, these, these other guys over here are called isotopes. These guys are called isotopes because they're different than the than our, our original one over here that we've that, that was identified. So those are called isotopes. Um, and basically they're they're the same element with the same number of protons. Uh, and the same atomic number, but they have a varying or a different number of neutrons. Um, there can be, a, a, for a different element, there can be a, a wide number of, of isotopes, so it's not always a, necessarily a set number. Um, so, you know, with hydrogen, they're showing three of them here. I don't know if that's all that they have, um, but, you know, it, it's, that's what it's showing. The thing about isotopes is they're going to have a different atomic weight. Um, it's going to be close to the mass number of the most abundant isotope, but the atomic weight reflects the natural isotope variation. So when we're talking about an atomic weight of a particular um, uh, molecule, this one right here is going to have 
Remember, I told you that um, one proton, one uh, each proton equals one AMU atomic mass unit. So that's um, this this hydrogen atom. Remember, and it's 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 um, uh, atomic number. Its atomic number is one because it has one proton, right? So that's what its atomic number is, refl directly reflects the number of protons. Um, but it also has an AMU, if we measured it by itself, it has an AMU of one. This one, on the other hand, because protons and neutrons both, because this equals one AMU, and this equals one AMU, that's going to be two AMUs. It still only has one proton, so its, its atomic number is still going to be one. Um, however, it has two elements in the middle. It has one proton, one neutron. So its weight, atomic weight, atomic weight is two. And we can do the same thing over here, and this one's going to have an atomic weight of three, right? So you can see where the weight comes in. Now what they do is, and of course these little guys, remember they have a one two thousandth um, AMU. Sorry, AMU. So what they do in order, when, when they put a, an element's atomic weight on that periodic scale, they take all of the variants or all of the isotopes of a particular they take all of these and all the combined weight, so it would be, um, this would be basically, we would have one plus one, two thousand, right? So we're counting that electron. Uh, and then we would add two and then add three. And then we would take all of that and divide it by three. So we would take that number there and divide it by three, and that's going to give us the atomic weight of a particular element. So that's how that weight is determined. So it's not just the weight of this one element, it's the weight of all three of the elements, including the electron. Um, and that's how they come up with that weight, and that's what this is talking about. The atomic weight reflects the nat natural isotope variations that they know about. So they'll take all of those isotope variations and they'll add the, the normal one that we see and then all the isotopes that there is and then they're going to divide that by the number that they found um, whatever that is and I, I just threw a bunch of numbers up there that's not don't think that that has any real meaning so so when we look at this um, and I was trying to see if there's hydrogen yeah here's hydrogen this is the one we've been talking about this is that one that we've looked at remember it has an atomic weight of one it has an atomic mass number of one. I'm sorry, it has an atomic number of one, a, a mass number of one, because it's a number of protons, uh, protons and neutrons. So there's one of each of those. And this is just a number of protons. But if we look over here at this atomic weight, it's off. It's a little different. Um, it's because it's taking into consideration the variation of the, uh, of the, um, the various... Um, isotopes and my math for the, for figuring out how what that is going to be you know taking all the isotopes and adding them together may not be correct but basically they're taking into consideration the weight of those other isotopes to come up with that number um, and that's where we get that variant um, so when we look at the atomic number the the uh, the atomic number the mass number and the weight uh, and we realize that those are a little bit different um, it's because of the variance um, and this actually tells us the number of electrons in its valence shell. The valence shell is the outer shell. It's the outer shell of each of the electrons. So this has two electrons in its outer shell. Um, but if we look at its number, it actually is, it has an atomic number of 20. So it means it has 20 protons. Um, and, and it would have 20 neutrons uh, and 20 electrons. But its outer shell only has two electrons in it. So that's, that's where that number's talking about. So that tells us, this, tell, this, gives us, this over here gives us an idea of what a, uh, 
how, how a particular element will be able to interact with other elements. Um, and oxygen interacts pretty well with other elements. So um, there are some isotopes that are considered radioisotopes, and we're not going to get heavily, you know, really, really, really deep into those. But these are heavy isotopes of certain atoms, um, and not atoms that we have in our body um, because uh, uh, they would not be good. Um, these radioisotopes tend to be unstable, and they start to they start to decompose. They start to lose neutrons from inside of their nucleus. Uh, they start to emit these neutrons out. Um, and what that is called, it's called uh, um, atomic decay. Um, and as a radioisotope begins to decay, it releases those neutrons out of its nucleus. Um, and it's between the neutrons and the electrons and those kinds of things that are being released at high speeds um, that's causing it to pinball through um, all of the rest of the radioisotope and then through space and, you know, into walls in our bodies and those kinds of things. When we talk about nuclear stuff, um, we're talking about radioisotopes. Um, some of that stuff is actually used for nuclear medicine for, for good purposes. Um, other stuff is not. Of course, you know, this is x-rays. Um, x-rays go right through our body, um, but they uh, don't go through bone very well, so bone kind of absorbs some of that radioisotope that we use for x-rays um, and, uh, and it, it doesn't collect on the film on the other side so we don't uh, we don't you know wherever a bone is at we see white on the x-ray so that's radioisotopes um, not not real big concern about getting you know real in-depth into those um, it's not something that I'm going to test you on but um, just just need to become somewhat familiar so what's a molecule um, when we take a couple of atoms and we put them together and they're able to interact in such a way that they connect to each other, we consider that a molecule, um, especially if they're of the same element um, they, and, and they're where they've been chemically combined. Um, and then it gives us an example of an, a, a, a chemical reaction that results in a molecule. If you take a hydrogen atom, add a hydrogen atom, and then we've got H2, meaning we have two hydrogen atoms connected together, and that's where we get the little 2 after the H. Um, uh, let's see, let's see if it'll, well, I thought maybe it might have a picture up there for us. Um, if we've got a compound, a compound is actually two or more. So uh, a molecule, and, and, and forgive me, but oftentimes I will refer to a molecule as um, a combination of any number of, of atoms. But really a molecule is a combination of two like atoms, two of the same atoms. Um, and a compound is a combination of multiple different types of atoms. Um, oftentimes, I just mentally have a, have a tough time making that distinction, um, and a compound just seems odd to say. Um, but So if I refer to something as a molecule, even though it has different elements, um, I'll try not to let it confuse you, um, because I do myself have trouble keeping that straight in my head. Um, but I'm not going to test you on, I'm not going to ask you a test question of what a compound is versus a molecule, um, just because, uh, I, you know, I, I, as long as you understand the distinction between the two, um, you're going to be just fine. It's made it, it's gotten me this far in life, and, uh, and I still have trouble with, you know, distincting, making that distinction between compound and molecule. But um, compound here that they're talking about, we take four hydrogens of carbon, and we get CH4, which is methane. Um, so that's, a, that's an example of it. So um, basically, uh, uh, another example of this is, is we can take sodium, um, which is a, is a metal, um, and combine it with chlorine gas, which is a very toxic gas. Um, either, you know, especially this one right here, all by itself in our body would not be a good thing, um, because in an abundance it would kill us. But if we combine these two together, we have normal table salt. Something we probably use, I, I almost guarantee you, that we use it every single day. Interesting thing about uh, table salt in the United States is almost all table salt, salt is iodized. Um, it's iodized, meaning it contains iodine. Um, and the reason why that they do that is, is um, the American diet, as with a lot of diets around the world, do not contain enough iodine. And without enough iodine, it'll cause it can cause what's called a goiter, or this kind of this large growth on the neck with the, one of the glands in the neck. Um, so what they do is we have in the States, 
and, and in a lot of most countries around the world, they have salt that's already iodized, so we get our iodine through our salt. Now, don't think that you should eat tons of salt because you need iodine. Um, that's not the case. Most everything that you eat nowadays, especially anything processed, probably has salt, probably more than what we need. Um, probably one of the things that we should uh, restrict a lot more of in our diet. So, chemical reactions. Chemical reactions happen when uh, um, atoms either combine, come together, or when they disassociate with each other, they, there's a chemical reaction that takes place. Um, and these atoms are united by chemical bonds. Um, atoms disassociate from one another or from other atoms when chemical bonds are broken. So we create a chemical bond, we bond, some, we bond atoms together, we break that bond, um, we pull them apart, we chemically break that bond apart. Both of those things are going to require um, energy, um, either to unite or break apart a chem you know, bonds, typically, depending on the type of bond. Um, oftentimes, there's energy associated either with uh, bringing a, creating a bond or breaking a bond. And sometimes, just the, the process of breaking a bond creates energy in and of itself. So the body tries to utilize bonds of certain um, compounds uh, certain compounds are much better at releasing a lot more energy. Um, for example, um, glucose, uh, it's a form of sugar. Um, it, breaking that bond releases quite a bit of energy. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very good substance for our body to use. Others include uh, some of the carbohydrates, some of those starchy foods and those types of things, some of those proteins that we eat um, have um, high high energy chemical bonds so when we break them apart we can get some of the, we can take some of that energy from it and we use that energy to not only move for our bodies to move but also for our bodies and different organ systems to perform different tasks and create things and put proteins together and rebuild torn muscles and all that kind of stuff so that's what that's what that energy is used for um, but our body wants to have the most efficient form of energy um, in order for it to use it unfortunately um, once again, in the American diet, in our diets, we, uh, we have way too much of very efficient energy sources, uh, so much so that our body doesn't utilize all of them that we take in on a daily basis. And when that's the case, if we don't burn up that energy that we take in, our body decides to store it. Um, it stores it and says, hey, look, we might need this later, so we're going to store it. I am a very efficient, um, uh, my body is a very efficient means for storing energy. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and that has made me very plump because I, my body just loves to store energy um, and I need to begin to use a lot more of it. Anyway, all right. Remember we talked about those electrons and those electron shells are the different levels, you know, the different, you know, the inner shell and the outer shells and all that kind of stuff, which we're going to talk about some more. Um, uh, like I said, the electrons closest to the nucleus are most strongly attracted. So those in that, those two in that very first shell are going to have a pretty strong attraction. The electrons will, um, and of course, each shell has a distinct property. It has an upper, it has a number limit of the electrons that it can hold. Um, shells closest are, are going to fill up first, and then it's going to go on out and out after that. Um, uh, bonding. When we talk about electrons and we talk about chemical bonding. Of, of molecules and compounds. Um, it involves only the interaction between electrons in the outer shell or that valence shell. Remember I told you the outer shell is called the valence shell. So only those electrons in that valence shell are going to be involved in uh, a chemical bo bonding or chemical forming. Um, atoms with a full valence shell don't form bonds. So if we have an atom that has a full valence shell, it can't interact with any other atoms. It has no way of doing that. So um, it's uh, uh, those particular atoms, we call them inert, when that valence shell, remember the outer shell, is complete, meaning it's full. Um, so we'll look at those shells. Um, if I draw a little diagram, and, and this is our nucleus with protons and neutrons in it. Um, and then this is the first one, this is the second shell, and this is the third. Those are the third. Um, the first shell can hold two, one, two. The second one can, can hold eight. Here we go, we got our eight. The third one can hold up to 18. 
But the interesting thing about the third one, it feels full and comfortable when it has eight. Okay? So this outer shell will interact. If this only has six in it, if this, if this one here only has six, um, and it's got, and it's not, it can take up to 18, remember, but it will interact with another atom um, because it's got room to interact with two more electrons. Now, if this has eight and it can hold 18, once it's reached eight or more, it's not going to interact with others, all right? So this outer shell feels comfortable at eight, and I think they call that the rules of eight, um, and, uh, but it can go up to 18, and, and I don't know if there's another shell outside of that. I, I have no idea. There probably isn't, and there's probably some chemist among one of you guys that is laughing at me for suggesting that there's a third shell. So, but anyway, remember as these get further out away from the nucleus, the attraction that these electrons have to the nucleus become weaker and weaker um, because they're further away. Um, a lot easier for um, other elements to interact with those um, electrons. So when we look at the outermost shell and we look at helium, notice the one thing about helium. Its inner shell has, has uh, one, two electrons in it. Its inner shell is absolutely full. It cannot interact with any others. It's called inert. Um, it's, it's one of those that's considered an inert element. Neon is the same way. Remember, the first shell can hold two. The second shell can hold eight. The second shell is full with all of its eight, um, meaning it cannot interact with another element um, because this outer shell is full, um, and that's neon. Okay, um, We're familiar with helium. Um, uh, neon is one of those that's uh, used for neon lighting. Um, it's a gas that's used for that type of lighting. I have no idea how that works, but it's something about what neon does when we apply an electrical charge to it. It does something interesting. I guess it glows. Um, I have no idea. Uh, rule of eights, like I talked about, atoms, atoms are considered stable when their outermost orbital has eight electrons. Um, now, that's true of all of them except for like um, hydrogen that only has one electron in its one shell, um, and, and that's what this is talking about, which can only hold up to two electrons. So that's true for all but hydrogen. Hydrogen's a little different. Okay? All right. If that outermost sh shell is incomplete, that atom is able to react with other elements. Um, they will, that atom can gain or lose or share electrons to complete their outermost orbitals. Um, the atoms want to reach this stable state. Um, that's their desire. They want to be stable. So they will interact readily and easily with other elements in order to gain, lose, or share electrons so they can complete that outer shell. That's their goal. Um, and of course, this bond produces a, a stable valence shell when they bond um, because that's the goal. It wants to become stable. Um, so we can look at a couple of, uh, uh, or we can see some reactive elements. Helium, or I'm sorry, hydrogen, I why I said helium, but hydrogen only has one electron in its, in its outer shell, which is, just happens to be the first shell. So it has room for another one over here. It can take one. Um, we look at carbon. Interesting thing about carbon, it only has four. So carbon can go up to eight. So it can take another four. So carbon can interact with several elements at once in order to complete this shell or make an attempt to complete this shell. Oxygen, we look at oxygen. It's got six in its outer shell. It can add two. Um, and it can do this in a variety of different ways. Um, and of course, um, sodium has one in its outer shell, so it can add seven. Um, so we can we can start to kind of see that these guys are uh, willing and able to accept other um, elements to re interact with. Um, the thing about these two are this, these are all very abundant in the body. Um, so uh, there's there's a lot of interaction that goes on among them. So the first of the chemical bonds that we're going to talk about is uh, ionic bonds. Um, the ionic bonds form 
when electrons are completely transferred from one atom to another. So when they completely transfer the electrons from one atom to another, meaning here, take my electrons. Um, now this only happens in those elements that are large enough that those electrons are far enough away from the nucleus that they, could, they can afford to give them up. Remember, as that distance increases, the attraction between the two decreases as well, um, and then the electrons are easier to give up. So what this, ha what this does is, is it allows the, the atoms, the, at the two atoms that are interacting, to get their stability through the transfer of these electrons. So one's going to give up electrons and the other's going to take on electrons, and the process is going to balance the two of them out, their outer shells. Now, it won't balance the charge out because if this little guy gives up an electron, if he boots an electron out, then all of a sudden the overall charge of this thing is going to become more positive. But if uh, this guy over here, if he takes on another electron, then his overall charge is going to become more negative because he's got more electrons than protons in the middle. This guy's got less electrons than protons, and you can see how the charges begin to take over, and we'll wind up with a positive and negatively charged um, uh, atom, um, and that's where we get those ions. Remember, we, we talked a little bit earlier about ions, um, cations and anions, and that's where those come from, and that's how those are formed, um, and that's what this next slide tells us about. So from the, the gain or loss of electrons, um, anions are negative. Anions, anti, an means against. Um, if you guys have taken an anatomy class, that means against. Um, cations is a positive, so that's a positive charge. So we're talking about anions and cations. A um, couple term, pieces of terminology that you guys will need to remember. These are really good testable items right here. You know, we'll just asterisk those. Um, so you want to know what the difference between an anion and a cation is. Um, the interesting thing is, is because, because one loses an electron and one gains an electron, one of these guys down here becomes positively charged, and one of these guys down here becomes negatively charged. Because they're positive and negative charges, they all of a sudden become attracted to each other because of these charges that they have. Positive is attracted to negative. So they become attracted to each other. Um, and a perfect example of this is uh, sodium and chloride. Because of the chemical nature of sodium and chloride, sodium is more than willing to uh, give up electrons. Sodium is going to give up electrons to chloride. Chloride is going to take them on. Sodium is going to become more positive. Chloride's going to become more negative, and then when these guys are put together um, outside of a water source, if once we once we evaporate the water that may be around them, we wind up with a substance called NaCl, which is sodium chloride or table salt. So, um, in all those big salt mines that you see, of course you know uh, uh, ocean water. Ocean water tastes salty, but if we take ocean water and we evaporate the water from you know, the other elements, all of a sudden this sodium and the chloride that's present in the ocean water begins to coalesce and it comes together because of their charges as that begins to evaporate and we wind up with sodium chloride. We wind up with a, with a compound, almost said molecule, we wind up with a compound of sodium chloride. We put water in it, um, these two will easily kind of disassociate, they'll stay in close proximity, but they'll disassociate uh, from each other in water. So that's sodium chloride, um, and, here, and here it's showing the same thing. We got the sodium. It's got a. It's got this electron right here that it's willing to donate. Remember, if this gets rid of this electron, then it's only got eight in this outer shell that's left. Right? That's what it's trying to. That's what it's trying to get to. The rule of eight. Chloride. It's only got seven out here, so it needs one. This donation here causes this one to become stable. The outer shell. And this donation here caused this one to be stable, right? So we stabilized the two of them, and what we've done is, is because sodium gave up an electron, it becomes positive. Chloride gains an electron, it becomes negative. The attraction between the two 
it still has. So the two are going to stay in relative close proximity to each other. And, and if we remove any kind of liquid solution that's around them, they'll actually come together. Okay? Covalent bonds are another form of chemical bonds. Covalent bonds are a little different um, than, uh, than ionic bonds um, because, the, it's, because they're not donating electrons, they are sharing electrons. Okay? Um, atoms will share these electrons, um, and they're usually, uh, uh, are usually shared in pairs. So a single covalent bond will share one pair of electrons. Double covalent bonds will share two pairs of electrons. So it's going to share these electrons in pairs. And what it means is it's literally sharing these electrons. What happens is, say, hydrogen, for example. Remember, hydrogen only has one in its shell, so it's got space for one. And so does this hydrogen over here. Both of them have space for one more electron. So in order to kind of fix that, what they're going to do is they're going to share this pair of electrons. So these two electrons are going to spend an equal amount of time whizzing around these two outer shells here of these two um, atoms. And, you know, they're gonna, it's going to create um, these two here with one kind of big cloud um, between the two of them where those electrons are sharing their time around the two of them. Um, this is a molecule of hydrogen gas. This is a very strong bond between the two of them. They, they like that relationship, and they're not going to give it up easily. So it's going to be tough to separate the two of them. Um, and, we, and we see this uh, right here is kind of how, they, how we will write this molecule, because it's a molecule. Remember, it's just one. It's, we're using two of the same atoms. Okay, so another example of that, this is something that you guys have seen, uh, probably referenced before, or you're at least familiar with. If we look at the oxygen atom, um, the oxygen atom only has six in its outer shell, right? It's got six out here. Each one of these has six in its outer shell, and it needs eight to complete it. So it needs two more electrons to complete this outer shell for each one of them. The way that it can, the way that the oxygen can manage that is it can come over here. It can, it can share four electrons between the two molecules, and this outer shell will start to kind of, um, you know, we've got four of these that are going to whiz around here like normal, and then we've got four that are going to be shared between the two of them, and we wind up with the oxygen molecule um, um, O2. So um, this is something that our body uses all the time, O2, uh, and, and we'll talk about how O2 is used in the body and the significance of the fact that it's two oxygen molecules. Um, but O2 should be something that we're very familiar with. Um, and that's that bond between the two. That's why oxygen, um, we don't find oxygen all by itself in the atmosphere. Oxygen isn't just floating around one oxygen, you know, millions of single oxygen molecules floating around in the atmosphere. It doesn't happen that way. It's because they're going to join up like this right here. They're going to do this. They're going to become a molecule because their desire is so great to complete this outer shell that they're going to join up in order to complete the outer shell, and they're going to share those electrons to do that. So if we took two lonely, isolated oxygen molecules, we wouldn't even have to put them on eHarmony. We'd take these two little oxygen molecules, put them in a room together. They're going to find each other immediately without any of our help. They're going to, they're going to bond together, and they're going to create a perfect and permanent union. Now, I say it's permanent. This bond can be broken, but it takes a lot of energy to break this bond. Uh, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of work to break this bond. It's not a bond that's going to be broken easily. So, so that is, that's an example of a covalent bond. Um, another example we can see here, we can see this carbon atom right here. Um, this carbon atom only has four in its outer shell. It's just got these little four guys out here, and it needs four more. Well, guess what? Hydrogen only has one in each one of its outer shells, so it can actually form a covalent bond with four hydrogen atoms. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what we get when we get methane gas. We see the C and the four hydrogens, um, and that's how that's shared, and that's just an example of covalent bonds. Tough to break that bond. Um, oftentimes when we do break this bond, it releases a lot of energy too. 
So, um, covalent bonds are either nonpolar or polar, meaning they are they are electronically neutral or they may have a positive or negative charge, depending on the covalent bond and and, and how that works. Um, th this is where it gets where it can get a little bit confusing, but just kind of bear with me. I think it'll all make sense to you in the end. Um, electrons are shared equally between the atoms of the molecule um, with nonpolar bonds. If the bond is nonpolar, that means the, the electrons are shared equally. Nobody's hogging the electrons, and that keeps that thing equal, neutral. Nothing, no, nothing, no problems there. Carbon dioxide is an example of that. We've got the carbon molecule here in the middle, um, and then we've got the O, the o on the sides, um, and that is a completely neutral um, arrangement because they're all sharing this, the electrons that they're sharing in their bonds equally. Actually, it's probably more like this. You know, these sharing a couple of them here, sharing a couple of them here, balancing out. Um, it's all working out well, okay? Um, polar bonds, on the other hand, is when these electrons are not shared equally between the atoms. One side has actually got the electrons for a little bit, for a little bit more of the time than the other side, which makes one side positive and one side negative, um, or polar. Um, an example of that is water. It may seem odd that water is actually a polar substance, but it really is. When we take a look at it, I'll show you. So, what happens is, is we've got this oxygen molecule, um, and in its inner shell there's two, outer sh inner shell there's two, and then its mm -hmm. outer shell it's got six, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, bear with me. Um, and then we've got this little hydrogen molecule over here, and its outer shell has one, right? And then we've got another little hydrogen molecule over here, and its outer shell just has one. So oxygen really badly wants to complete its outer shell, and so does hydrogen. But realize this, this shell right here, the outer shell here, is much, much closer, right? These outer shells for the hydrogens are much closer to the nucleus. So there's going to be a stronger attraction to an electron in this outer shell. So when it creates this bond right here, this electron sharing, it's actually going to be pulled a little bit harder towards, this electron is going to actually be pulled a little bit harder towards the hydrogens on this bond, which is going to cause the hydrogens keeping this electron for most of the time in its outer shell is going to cause the hydrogens, oops, I got that backwards, it's going to cause the hydrogens to become more positive. Actually, the, the pull is going to, it's going to pull the electrons um, the opposite way because the that um, the, there's a lot more protons, sorry, there's a lot more protons here in the middle of the oxygen that's going to pull the electrons from the hydrogen a lot more. Um, so bear with me. Um, the, the electrons are going to spend most of their time in the, uh, with the uh, oxygen, um, which is going to cause the, the hydrogens to become more negative and the, ox or the hydrogens to become more positive, the oxygen to become more negative. And we can see that polar polarity on this. Um, what that means is um, it gives oxygen, a, or I'm sorry, it gives water a very unique ability to, in order to be able to interact with other H2O molecules. Um, and it's what gives what, what we refer to as surface tension. Because if we have, um, we've got, if we've got more H2O molecules like this, and I'm just going to kind of draw them like this, um, these are positives. These are negatives. Um, so as oxygen, as H2O molecules get closer together, they're going to be, the negatives are going to be drawn to the positives. So these negatives are going to be, want to go towards the positives and the, the uh, positive and the, and the opposite's going to work here. So you can see how these are going to, these are going to pull together this is this is going to pull together with this one and it's going to find another one over here and they're going to pull together so what it's going to do is going to cause these molecules to have an attraction enough of an attraction together 
that it's going to it's going to create almost like a bridge between them. Now the interesting thing it's pretty easy to break that bridge and 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 because all it's going to take is for us to stick our finger in the water and we break some of the bridges between these molecules here. Um but um there is a bridge there and that attraction is enough that it, when we pull our finger out the water's all just going to go right back together and that and those that attraction is still going to exist. But this is because of the way that this electron these, this electron sharing here is not being done equally. Oxygen's kind of hogging the electrons for a, a, an extended period, um, and uh, the poor hydrogens are becoming more positive because the oxygen's hogging them. So that creates what this right here, this, this here is what's called a hydrogen bond. It's because of the positives and negatives attractions of the hydrogens to the oxygens. Um, is creating that hydrogen bond. Um, it's where the the uh, the negative portion is a is a, of the polar molecule, and it gives us that attraction. And it, like I said, it's, it gives us uh, it's responsible for the surface tension of water. Um, um, it's also why you know if you uh, fall out of an airplane and land on water, it's not going to be really any softer than landing on concrete um, because that surface tension that that, that negative-positive attraction between these molecules here is, is still fairly strong. And if, it, if hit at high speed, it's not going to break that quickly. It's, it's going to hold together pretty well. Um, and here's, here gives us an example of how the um, positives and negatives are attracted to each other um, and, and how that bond works. Um, and we can see this this water spider over here, water bug over here, how it's able to stand on the water because of this um, attraction that we're seeing over here between the uh, water molecules. We can see where it's kind of bent even where it's standing on it, but it hasn't, it's not enough to actually break the bonds that we're seeing over here. It's just kind of bending them. Um, so it's, it's an interesting picture of, of the surface tension of water. All right. All right, so chemical reactions. Um, and when we bring molecules together, atoms or molecules together, um, there's different types of reactions that we can have. Two main types that we're going to look at are synthesis reactions and decomposition reactions. Um, synthesis reaction is basically where we take two component parts um, up here, combine them together, and create a different molecule or chemical. Um, this is uh, um, a lot of times uh, the body will do these types of things internally to create different um, proteins and molecules and different types of that and substances that it needs um, for the inner workings of the body and, and part of the way the body communicates with other parts of the body. Another way that it does it is decomposition. We see this in the digestive tract where it will take a molecule or, or a uh, compound and it will break it down into its component parts so that those component parts can either be used to build something else um, or it's breaking this down to release energy, you know, um, and it's going to grab that energy and it's going to store it. Uh, so it does it for different reasons. Um, uh, oftentimes some energy is released, but not always. Sometimes we're just breaking that down um, so that we can use some of the component parts to do other things. So, uh, Synthesis uh, basically brings a bunch of different molecules um, or particles together um, and creates, you know, a protein molecule. This one took amino acids, amino acid molecules, and created a protein molecule. Okay. All right. We can break things down. We can take glycogen and we can break that down into all of these glucose molecules um, in the process of breaking down this we release some energy and actually these little glucose molecules can be utilized in another process to break down um, glucose and oxygen together um, to create that that stuff that I was telling you about ATP um, glucose is a key player in that um, and it's very important that we have enough glucose and enough oxygen in order to create ATP all right there are there is another reaction that's called an exchange reaction Basically, it involves synthesis and decomposition reactions both, where we take two component substances, um, 
bring them together. We create this and release this, or you know, we take these two here and switch them around and create those two things. Um, uh, those are exchange reactions. Those happen a lot in our body, um, especially when we talk about the gas exchange process um, and how our body deals with oxygen and carbon dioxide um, and those types of things. Um, a lot of that has a lot of those are exchange reactions that are going on and how it's transporting those things and utilizing them. Um, and here's just an example of that. It's using ATP. Um, and this is the ATP that I talked about is the adenosine triphosphate. Um, and what happens is, is when it, when it loses a, a phosphate molecule, when it loses a phosphate molecule, it becomes adenosine diphosphate. Because there's, you see these three phosphates over here. That's where we get the tri, is the three. When we, when we kick one of these guys off of here, when we boot them off the team or off the island, um, we release a lot of energy have a big energy release, um, and that's the energy that we've stored up that we want to use for something in the body. So we release that energy, and this molecule of ATP, when when it when it when we release, whoops, sorry, when we release the energy, it releases a phosphate, and then that becomes ADP. P. Wow. Wasn't even a vowel in there, and I got that wrong. Um, uh, it releases a DP, okay? So it, re it or becomes a DP. ATP, when it releases its energy, becomes a DP. And then in order for a DP to become ATP again, that phosphate needs to be reattached over here, which, caught, which uses energy to reattach it, and that's the equivalent of resetting the spring on the mousetrap, okay? So that's what ATP is and what it does. It's this, this phosphate right here is the energy store. It's the spring on the mousetrap. When we release that spring, energy down here is released along with this little phosphate is released. So now we've got this, this, this substance down here called ADP, but we, it's a, it's a mousetrap that needs to be reset. So it's going to go back through this process. Um, a process we'll talk about later, the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Um, it's going to go back through this process and it's going to get reset. It's going to have its phosphate reattached to it um, uh, and it's going to use energy to do that and it'll become ATP again. Okay, We'll talk about that more later though. Um, most of these reactions that go on are reversible as I've kind of alluded to on that last slide. Um, uh, reversibility is usually indicated by a double arrow um, like that. Usually have a little double arrow. Um, when they differ in length, the longer arrow indicates the more rapid the reaction. Um, of course, there are factors that influence the rate of chemical reactions. Um, different things can affect that. Temperature variations have a big impact on chemical reactions. Um, the size of the particle, um, if there has to be catalysts or any, anything like that, and of course the concentration of any of the components that are required. Um, inorganic compounds, um, when we talk about the different compounds that our body uses, there's uh, inorganic and organic compounds. Um, the inorganic compounds, what distinguishes them from organic compounds, inorganic do not contain carbon. Um, they're usually smaller, much simpler. Organic compounds contain carbon much larger, have covalent bonds uh, for their molecules. Remember, covalent bonds, uh, is uh, they're sharing electrons, so they're much harder to break apart. Inorganic stuff doesn't have that. They have simple molecules, such as water, salts, and some acids. Um, usually, they're a little bit easier to break down. Um, of course, water is a co covalent bond, um, so it would be a little tougher to break down. Um, if you're curious how you break down water, you remember water is H2O. How do you break water down into two hydrogens and an oxygen? Actually, you wouldn't break it down into two hydrogen and oxygen because once the oxygens are separated, they would attract to each other. But how do you break that down? It's simple. Put it in a pot, get the temperature up to like 220 degrees or something like that, whatever the boiling point of water is. When water begins to boil, you see the bubbles in the water? That's We've created enough heat in there to break this bond and release hydrogen and oxygen, and that's the bubbles that you see, is the hydrogen and oxygen being released. Um, so that's what boiling water is, 
is the breaking down of, of H2O, the hydrogen and the oxygen. So, anyway, back to our story. Um, organic compounds, large covalently bonded. Um, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids are all in that category, in that group. We're going to talk about those a little bit. Water is the most abundant of the inorganic compounds, um, and it is. there's a lot of it in the body. It makes up, um, there's debate, it's between 65 um, and 70% water. Some will say as high as 75%, but that's what our body is made up of. Um, there's a lot of water in the body. Um, the great thing about water, it has a great heat capacity, so it can dissipate heat, it can absorb heat. Um, it has polarity and solvent properties, which is uh, oftentimes we refer to water as the universal uh, universal solvent. It's safe for the body, um, and it can dilute things, um, dilute things down. It's very helpful. Um, it does have some chemical reactivity, um, and if you don't know what I mean by that. Um, ask a, near fire, a nearby firefighter what happens when you mix sodium and water, uh, it's powdered sodium and water, uh, and, and it's a pretty violent reaction. Um, and also water is pretty good at cushioning. Um, it actually does a little bit of cushioning in our body. Um, all right, so uh, like I said, water, water absorbs and releases heat. Um, it helps us maintain and regulate our body temperature by regulating the amount of water. Um, we talked about the polar the polarity of water before, um, and I, like I said, it's, it is the universal solvent, um, uh, and of course, a solvent can be a gas as well, um, but what it's going to do, it's going to dissolve, um, dissolve things down into smaller amounts. Um, uh, a solution is going to form when the solutes are very tiny. Um, colloid forms when solutes uh, of intermediate size form uh, a translucent mixture. So when we start to dehydrate some of that water out of there, um, it can change things. Um, uh, water is also an important reactant in some chemical reactions. Um, uh, one of the things that, that we talk about is hydrolysis, uh, meaning when we, we add water to something, um, it, it changes it. Um, so the effect of water, either adding or taking away water, to something can affect it. Um, water actually helps digest food um, and, uh, and break down other molecules. Um, so water is, is very helpful, but oftentimes we'll, it's referred to as hydrolysis. Um, of course, hydro meaning water. Okay. Um, of course, and it, it helps protect the body. It does provide some cushioning. Um, there's a lot of salts that are contained in the body. Um, and these salts oftentimes are going to contain uh, cations other than hydrogen. We're going to talk more about hydrogen later and the issues that the body has with hydrogen. Um, these will easily disassociate into their component ions in water. So sodium chloride that I talked about, um, sodium and the chloride is going to separate. Sodium is going to have the positive charge. Chloride is going to have the negative um, I, uh, cation, anion kind of a deal. Um, these salts are vital to many functions, and I say salt, and we're talk, we talk about sodium chloride, but there's other salts as well. There's magnesium and, you know, magnesium chloride and some other things like that that are also considered salts um, that are equally as important um, in, in the body and other than just sodium chloride. Um, we can see this right here. It's showing the salt crystal here and then the water here, the water solution, the H2O. And you can see how this sodium crystal and this chloride crystal all get kind of embedded within the water. But you'll notice that it's just the oxygen molecules here because of the polarity of those. The oxygen's more negative, and it's the hydrogen molecules here because they're more positive and the chloride's more negative. And you can kind of see how those disassociate and kind of get taken up by the, uh, um, by the, the positive and negative charges of sodium and, or uh, of H2O <clears throat> and how they that this is a this also explains how that when you put salt in water or when you put sugar <clears throat> excuse me sugar is another a similar example of this um, but when you put salt in water how it will diffuse throughout the entire container of water um, because what's happening is is this is water is diluting this it's diluting this down or 
salt cube here. It's diluting this down, and as it does, the, the small molecules of water are actually taking up the sodium and the chloride and pulling it out so that eventually the sodium and the chloride is going to be dispersed throughout the entire container of water in equal amounts. What, when we run out of, of, of H2O molecules to take up the sodium and the chloride, the rest of whatever remains that can't be taken up into the water into the you know and, and held up into the whole matrix of water is just going to kind of collect at the bottom. It'll just kind of collect at the bottom. And, you know, take a look at your uh, um, one of your kids' glass of iced tea, or you know, one of your brother or sister's glass of iced tea that like to put you know tons of sugar in it. All that sugar that's sitting at the bottom is is the excess sugar that couldn't be taken up into the fluid. It, it's so saturated that it can't take anymore. All right. So all salts are electrolytes. Um, of course, in electrolytes, all electrolytes are ions that conduct electrical currents. Um, so, so when we talk about cations and anions, remember these electrolytes are all ions that can conduct an electrical current. That's going to be important to realize later, um, and that, and because there's interesting ways of how these electrolytes conduct electrical currents. Um, we'll talk about that in a later chapter. We'll really get into that really in depth when we talk about neurology and the nervous system. Um, but that's where we'll talk a lot about that. Acids, on the other hand, acids release hydrogen. So what happens is, is when we put an acid in water, it's going to release hydrogen. It's going to release, it's going to release all these free hydrogen molecules, which are not at all good for the body. Um, acids are usually referred to as proton donors um, uh, since uh, a hydrogen uh, since they donate these hydrogens strong acids ionize completely and liberate all of their protons or all of their yeah all of their protons um, so we have some acids that are considered weak acids that they do break down and disassociate in water but some of their hydrogen may stay bonded. It may not get released all on its own. But some others, um, like hydrochloric acid, um, hydrochloric acid, uh, when these two disassociate, this hydrogen is all on its own. So it releases all of its hydrogen. Um, weak acids, on the other hand, they have a tendency to hang on to some of that hydrogen bonded in some way. Um, so it's not as big of a problem. Um, fortunately, what we do have within our body are something that's called bases. Um, what they release is hydroxyl ions, or this OH right here. Um, the great thing about OH, remember hydrogen free floating by itself is like this, and then we have an OH that's negative. Whoops, sorry, I can't erase that. Um, we have an OH that's negative, um, and let's see. Uh, these two are going to attract to each other, and then we have H2O. So easily neutralizes that. When we have this OH, it'll help dissolve and uh, take up this hydrogen whenever that hydrogen's a problem. One best example of that is sodium bicarbonate. Or No, that's, I'm sorry, that's not sodium bicarbonate. Um, NaOH, um, this will disassociate in water, this NaOH. Um, and that leaves this OH to work on some of this hydrogen that may not be may not supposed to be there. Um, strong bases seek out hydrogen ions in order to bond with them. Uh, our bodies use this as a way to maintain balance. Um, our body is always kind of on this teeter-totter, and it's always trying to maintain this perfect balance. The interesting thing is for our body is, you know, we talk about hydrogen and we talk about acids and bases. And if we looked at this on a scale, um, um, and acid between acids and bases, and this would be acid, base, right down the middle is neutral. Seven is absolutely neutral on the scale. I know it seems really weird that seven would be neutral. What's even weirder is, is the lower the number, like three, the more acetic that is, and the higher the number, say uh, 10, the more basic it is. 
the the less the less hydrogen atoms there are. This scale is really tough. It doesn't make sense when we look at the the uh, p. Oh, sorry, it's a pH scale. That's what this is. This scale that we're looking at. What I want you to realize though is this scale is actually a reverse of the actual numbers that are associated with this. So. Um, this uh, scale that we're talking about is actually the inverse of uh, of what that is. Okay, uh, we'll talk about this more later. Uh, I just wanted to kind of bring this up and, and let you know that the body is always trying to maintain this balance between acid and base, um, and its perfect number is seven point three five to seven point four five. That's where the body is going to consider perfect, and that's what it's trying to maintain that balance of. So it's trying to maintain a balance of 7.35 to 7.45 of pH, or the measurement of hydrogen, the, the partial pressure measurement of hydrogen. How much hydrogen is free in the body, it wants to maintain that amount. Oh, I probably jumped way ahead, and hopefully I didn't just really mess you guys up. But um, it'll come clear. Um, I'm not going to test you heavily on that kind of stuff um, in this chapter anyway. I'm, I'm trying to kind of introduce some concepts to you. Um, that we're going to revisit later, so please don't panic when you're seeing some of this stuff. Um, if, if you're thumbing through your book trying to find it in your chapter and you don't see it, it's okay. I'm just trying to introduce you to some stuff a little bit early so when we talk about it again later, it's a little easier to make the connection. So don't, don't freak out. Don't send me a ton of emails just yet. Um, don't worry. I'm not going to torture you and expect you to know stuff that's not contained in your chapter uh, of what we're talking about. Um, even though I may talk about it in, in, in this context in the video. So, um, so uh, um, there are some other reactions called neutralization reactions. It's where we actually take a substance like this um, and uh, hydrochloric acid. We take this base and this acid and we work them over. We wind up with O2 and sodium chloride. Um, so these are some of the things that happen within our body because we expose these two here to water and they break apart and they wind up releasing this hydrogen which is which in too much of a quantity is actually toxic to the body or not enough of a quantity it can be dangerous too. Got to maintain that balance. Um, but in order to combat this strong hydrochloric acid or this strong amount of hydrogen, um, this this here will actually begin to take up some of that hydrogen. The chloride can bond with the sodium and we wind up with table salt and water. So interesting how that stuff works. Um, I just kind of talked about this. I mentioned this a couple of slides back when we talk about pH. Is What we're doing is we're measuring the concentration of hydrogen ions in the body. It is very, very important that our body maintains that balance. Remember I said it was 7.35 to 7.45. It's very important that we maintain that ratio to maintain that balance because outside of this range, this would be um, more base, this would be more acetic, okay? Uh, and please try not to try not to make your head explode trying to figure out why a lower number means more hydrogen ions, and a higher number means less hydrogen ions. Remember, this is actually a scale that we're using to measure that is the reverse of what the actual numbers are. So, um, base, uh, of course, it, the, the way that we measure pH um, is uh, in terms of moles per liter. So we're measuring the number of hydrogen moles per liter so that is uh, um, each change on the pH scale represents a tenfold change in the number of hydrogen ions. So if we go from uh, if we go from seven seven point three to seven point three one, it's a tenfold change if I remember that correctly. Um, but so what what you need to realize is is when we're talking about the number of when we're talking about the number on, when we're talking, referencing it in pH, so a pH of 7.35 um, gives us uh, 
an idea of the number of hydrogen ions that are within that concentration. Each number that we change on that scale increases it. It's a multiple of the previous number. So there's a lot of hydrogen ions when we talk about a change in that. Like I said, pH of 7 is completely neutral. It's neither acid nor basic. So completely neutral. A pH below 7 is an acid. A pH above 7 is a base. So um, if we're talking about hydrochloric acid, um, it's going to be somewhere around uh, 2 or 3, something like that. It might be a 1 or a 2. Um, actually, lemons um, um, is about a 3 on this scale. Uh, uh, it's very acetic, uh, a lemon is. Um, uh, baking soda, uh, sodium bicarbonate, um, is basic. Um, um, and it's, uh, it, it, baking soda is actually a buffer that we use to combat and regulate the pH changes. Okay. Yeah, where'd my buttons go? There they are. Okay, so um, this, this gives you an idea of um, acid and base. Um, completely neutral, right in here. Uh, pH of blood is 7.4. Um, egg whites, and then you can kind of go up. Oven cleaner. A lot of our cleaners and those kinds of things are very basic. Um, and then when we go down the scale this way, it becomes more acetic. Now remember, we're going down the scale, but that means we have an, more hydrogen ions. When we go up the scale, we have less hydrogen ions. I know it doesn't make sense, and it's really tough to distinguish when these numbers are getting smaller, the, num the amount of hydrogen is getting bigger, and when the numbers are getting bigger, the amount of hydrogen is getting smaller. I know that's kind of a tough pill to swallow, but please just accept it for what it is right now. Later on in a later chapter, I'll get some, uh, I'll, I'll brush up on my math skills a little bit, and we'll talk more about what a logarithm is. And that's this scale right here. This scale is actually a logarithmic scale, this, this scale that we're talking about right here. Um, oftentimes we see it represented going this direction instead of up and down. But this is a logarithmic scale. And we'll talk about logarithms and uh, um, scientific notation and a couple of things like that so that you'll understand where we're getting this pH scale thing from. It won't be something that I'll, I'll uh, test you on and go, I need you to convert a logarithm to a scientific notation. It won't be anything like that. It'll be just kind of an informational thing. I do like to throw out informational things to help, help you understand a little bit more about what it is we're talking about and where we get those things. If you're the type of person that you're like, I don't need to know that, just tell me this right here and I'll, and I'll memorize this and I'll memorize this and that will get me through life, it will. Um, but if you decide you want to go on to medical school, you're going to need to know more. Um, not saying that everybody's going, but if you're, if you're like me, I was always one of those types that I couldn't just accept this, and I couldn't just accept this. I, I kept asking why. Why is that? Why is that? It doesn't make sense to me. How does that work? So I, I, seek, I went ahead and seeked out that information, and it took me a very long time to figure it out. It was very frustrating, very confusing. Talked with a lot of other uh, fellow paramedics and nurses, and nobody could help me. Um, I figured it out. Finally, figured it out. Under you know, understand it relatively well. Um, and I, and for those of you that are like me that want to understand this a lot more in depth, um, I understand. And and, I, and I'll, there'll be a point in time later when I'll explain that a little bit more in depth. Um, but like I say, it won't be something that I'll I'll torture you with having to know. Okay. Um, uh, and of course, then there's some other uh, reactions that go on there. There's a polymer reactions. It's a chain-like molecule um, made of repeating units, such as monomers. Um, many biological molecules are, are polymers, um, such as the carbohydrates. Uh, carbohydrates are a good example of polymers. Proteins are, are as well. Um, and, uh, and, and the way that we create these Remember we talked about um, hydrolysis and that kind of stuff. Dehydration synthesis is a form of that, where we begin to dry things up, and it causes some of the monomers, the individual pieces of a chain, to join together 
to form polymers. So mono meaning one, poly meaning many. We take monomers, dehydrate the solution that they're in, they join together to become polymers. Um, and basically all we're doing is removing the water molecule. Um, also what happens is a hydrogen molecule or a hydrogen ion is removed from one monomer um, while a hydroxyl group is removed from um, uh, the other and it's joined together. Um, when these are joined together, water is typically what's released. Now, um, I know I, some of you guys may be feverishly writing and trying to take notes. Um, just know this. Um, this next section I'm not going to test you a whole lot over. Um, it's not a section that is, I mean, it's, we need to have just kind of a really uh, kind of a how do you do understanding to it. Not this, oh my gosh, I need to know exactly how uh, dehydration synthesis works and, and how different polymers come together and they form proteins and all that stuff. I'm not going to do that to you. I just want you to have an idea of kind of how this works. Um, by all means, if you're one of those really inquisitive types, this was not something that made me really inquisitive um, because when I tried to look into it um, when I was first learning, it was really, really deep stuff. Um, and, uh, and so I've opted not to uh, torture you guys a whole lot with it. Um, just want you to have a familiarization with it. We've got monomer one, monomer two, get rid of the water. And then we've got this linked by covalent bonds. We've got this other substance that we came, come, created. Hydrolysis is a little different, um, where we take polymers and we break them down um, by adding water. So we add water to it. It's the reverse of um, uh, it's the reverse of uh, dehydration synthesis. Um, is hydrolysis just the use of water? Okay. Um, carbohydrates. In this next part, we're going to talk about some different organic compounds that are present. Um, we're going to talk about these. All I want you to have is just a very, very general working knowledge of, hey, I've heard of that before, um, and I know we, I know uh, Rusty talked about it, but he promised me that he's not going to test me over it. Um, I'm not going to test you over it. I don't want you to think that it's unimportant. It is. Um, you're going to hear some of this terminology used a little bit more later. Um, but it's not something that I want you guys to spend all of your time trying to understand, okay? We will talk about some of these later. We might get a little bit more in depth into them, but we're not going to get crazy in depth. Um, just need you to have a familiarity of what these are. First one, of course, is carbohydrates. Um, they all contain a carbon, a hydrogen, and oxygen molecules. Um, and these include some of our sugars and starches um, or carbohydrates. We're familiar with that. This isn't a new term. You guys have probably heard that term mentioned before, um, but it's those sugars and those starches that we call carbohydrates. Um, and there's there, these carbohydrates are classified according to their size. Monosaccharides are very simple. Disaccharides have two. Of course, we've got di, uh, and, uh, uh, and then polysaccharides are long branching chains with multiple ones. So if you can remember, mono is simple. Di is two and poly is multiple or long branching chains. Um, you've got, you know what you need to know right now. So, uh, so that's about it. And then this is going to go a little bit more into, it's just a single chain. It's a very simple sugar, monosaccharide. It's a very simple sugar. It's not, not real complex. You can see how simple it is even here. Very, very simple. Not much to it. All right. Disaccharides. There's two simple sugars joined together. And this is done by dehydration, that what we talked about. Um, and we just see these two really simple sugars. There's not a whole lot to it there. Nothing fancy. All right. Um, and then, of course, this is that dehydration synthesis that comes up to get that. It wants to show us that again for some reason. Polysaccharides is going to have multiple ones. These are large, insoluble molecules. Um, and these are great for storage product, or, you know, for storing things. Um, starch. Glycogen are both good examples of that. Um, and when we see these large chains, this is this is a starch chain right here. Um, we can see these things are long. They're long. They've got little branches that come off of them up here and do little crazy things. Um, so these are these are polysaccharides. They're very complex forms. Um, and when we talk about complex carbohydrates and those kinds of things, that's what we're talking about are some of those complex things. Lipids. 
Lipids are a little diff different. They're the most abundant of the triglycerides um, uh, and phospholipids and steroids. Basically, they contain a carbon, a hydrogen, and an oxygen. Um, but the uh, carbon and hydrogen outnumber the oxygen. So a little different than carbohydrates. Remember, carbohydrates contained a lot of this too. Um, but this is uh, the outnumber the oxygen. The thing about these are, is because these, the carbon and the hydrogen are in such quantity, they're not soluble in water. So lipids don't, they don't break down in water. And you guys are probably familiar with that. Take some cooking oil, pour it in a glass of water, and you're going to see the cooking oil stand on, just sit right on top of the water. It's not going to break down. You can shake it up, stir it up, all that kind of stuff. It'll all collect right back at the top. So lipids are not going to be soluble in water. And then, of course, this gives us an example of several different types of lipids. Um, some of the lipids in here, um, of course, are cholesterol. There's even some bile salts, that kind of stuff. Some of our hormones, um, some steroids, that kind of thing are all some of those lipids. And then, then it goes on and down into a whole bunch of different ones. So we're not going to get too crazy about that. There are some common ones in the body that, uh, that, that we need to be aware of. Um, neutral fats or, or triglycerides, um, these are found in our fatty deposits. Um, they're stored energy. It's also something that we can, we can do a blood test and measure the triglycerides that are free in our body. And it gives us some indication of our risk, uh, at least it used to, of uh, heart disease and those types of things. Now we get a little bit more specific about which triglycerides we're looking at. And the one that we're mainly looking at is that cholesterol. Um, of course, then we have where we can look at these, uh, we can further categorize them, of course, by saturated or unsaturated. Um, and uh, the, uh, the difference between those are um, saturated fats. Um, they're solid at room temperature. Um, unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature. Okay? All right, and there's butter. Butter. Okay. Trans fats are oils that have been solidified by adding hydrogen. So these are all diet related. And of course, there's some omega-3 fatty acids um, that are found in fish. Um, lot, there was a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of talk about the, the benefits, the cardiovascular benefits of uh, omega-3 fatty acids. There's been research since then that really found out that they don't really do what they thought they did. Um, and there's really no benefit to taking those as a daily supplement. Um, uh, but uh, there for a while, a lot of people went around with fish breath um, because they were taking this, um, these omega-3 krill oil and all that kind of stuff um, that their cardiologist had put them on. Uh, and, uh, and now they're, they're not doing that so much anymore. Um, common lipids in the human body. There are some, there, there's a, these phospholipids. Um, we'll talk about these phospholipids, I think, in chapter, probably chapter three, I think, actually. These phospholipids are very important to all the, the cells in the human body. Um, these phospholipids actually make up the uh, membrane of cells. And what it is is the head carries an electrical charge and it's polar. Um, but the tails um, are the opposite. Um, and the, and the, what they do is they form this membrane. Um, the, uh, the heads of these things... And these, these little things, they kind of look like this. They kind of have this, this, this little tail like that. And uh, the head of these things like water. They love water. But the tails don't. They don't like, it. They don't like water. So what happens is, is when we use these to make a cell membrane, right? When we make a cell membrane out of them, when we stack them, in opposing directions like this, um, then this there's no water gets in here, but it's okay for water to be here and water to be here, but no water here in the middle. So um, they make a very good cell membrane because we can stack them like this in opposing directions and create a membrane of, all, of a whole bunch of these all stacked together like this, creating a membrane. All right, see what I'm talking about there? And then it'll keep the water and everything out of the center of that and keep it either inside the cell or outside of the cell. So that's what phospholipids do for us. We'll talk about them more in the next chapter. And there's the shape of them. We can see the two tails, right? There's the tails. 
Um, and here's the example that it, that it talks about. Um, steroids are another one. Um, steroids are very important. It's a part of the communication system um, of the body. It's also, one of them is uh, cholesterol. Um, bile salts are some others. Bile salts help us break down some of our foods. Vitamin D actually um, helps us process some other things. Um, uh, some cholesterol we, uh, we bring in from animal products that we eat, but some is actually made in the liver. The liver actually makes cholesterol. Um, cholesterol is the basis for all steroids made in the body. So cholesterol is actually vital. Cholesterol is extremely important to the body's function. So we cannot completely eliminate cholesterol, and the cholesterol medicines that we take do not completely eliminate the cholesterol in our body because it would be very dangerous to do so. If we eliminated all the cholesterol in our body, we wouldn't be able to you know, create steroids, and we also wouldn't be able to create cells because um, cholesterol is an essential part of cell membranes and those types of you know, interworking parts of cells. Cholesterol is important, but it needs to be maintained in the proper amounts in order for it to be safe. Proteins, of course, are, uh, they, ha they account for about over half of the body's organic matter and uh, provide for construction materials for body tissues. Um, they contain carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and they're built from amino acids of the foods that we take in. Okay? Um, and this, uh, this goes in to talk about the structure of amino acids. Amino acids is another one of those things that we're not going to talk about detailed because they, you know, they talk about varying by R groups and amine and, you know, contain an acid group and all that kind of stuff. We're not going to get crazy detailed about that. Um, you do need to understand that um, it takes amino acids to create proteins. Um, and there are hundreds of different types of amino acids. I think that's correct. There's, there's a lot of them anyway. A lot of different amino acids. Our body does use an essential amount of those to do some of the things that it does. Um, so um, in order to create proteins, it needs those. Um, here it says, in order to create polypeptides, it needs no more than fewer 50 amino acids to do that. Um, and of course, large proteins may have up to 50,000 amino acids. And of course, that sequence of amino acids produces different types of proteins. So it all depends on the sequence that we pair the amino acids in that will determine the type of protein that is created. Why is that important? Um, because uh, these proteins have different structures. Um, uh, and and uh, that kind of makes up the, the amino acids help to make up that structure. Um, the main thing that I wanted to get to was, uh, and I know that I'm kind of whizzing through here, um, I wanted to talk about the amino acids or the proteins, uh, some of the proteins that you would be more familiar with. Um, of course, one of them is uh, the fibrous proteins. Um, they, they make up body structures. Um, uh, they bind things together. Um, in body tissues, they, they help stabilize things. Um, collagen and keratin are good examples of that. Things that we find in our hair and nails and that kind of thing that give, us, give the hair and nails its strength. Collagen and keratin are examples of those. Um, and then we can see that triple helix of that. Um, there's also globular proteins. Um, these function as antibodies, vital to, the, uh, to our body. Also some hormones and even some enzymes. Um, those are all important. Um, enzymes are actually something that helps a reaction to occur. Antibodies protect us. Hormones are, are typically chemical messengers. Um, and these are all considered part of that protein group um, that, are, that, are, that are made up of those uh, um, uh, amino acids. Um, here's a really neat protein right here. Um, I doubt you recognize it, but it is hemoglobin. Um, hemoglobin is what carries what is what is contained on our red blood cells, and it's what carries oxygen to throughout the body. Um, uh, and uh, that we'll talk about hemoglobin a whole lot more when we get to uh, the chapter on blood. Um, it's part of the cardiovascular chapters. Um, we'll talk about this a whole lot more, um, we'll, but we'll uh, we won't talk about it how it's made and all that crazy stuff. But we'll talk about hemoglobin 
and its vital role in the body um, and, and, uh, uh, and how it works and you know what, how it bonds and all that. Because hemoglobin actually has some, um, actually has some iron in it um, that, that helps to attract the oxygen, which we'll talk about that later. Okay? All right, so list of all that. And then there's some enzymes that are in our body, um, act as biological catalysts. Enzymes kind of make things, they either bring things together or break things apart, um, but they don't really do the work. They're the ones that actually may bring two particular molecules and hold them together while a reaction happens. So they're not actually doing the work, they're just facilitating that be done. Enzymes may take, uh, carry one substance from one place to another place so that a reaction can happen. Um, some of the things that it does, it, it talked about here, um, it, that involve water or involve oxygen, um, some of those reactions that it'll do. You can see where it grabs a couple of substrates here, brings them together, holds them together for a long enough time to where that it releases water, and now we've got this little peptide bond. That's what enzymes do, and it can go on to continue to do that because it's not really using energy to do that. Um, and that's not what it's necessarily doing because it's not doing the work. Um, nucleic acids are another one of those important, uh, important protein kind of based things. Um, uh, these nucleic acids make up our genes, and no, not Levi's, um, but they make up our genes. Carbon, hydrogen, carbon oxygen, hydrogen, and ni nitrogen and phosphorus are included in those. Um, they're the largest biological molecules in the body. Um, and this is another one of those things that there are entire professions built around um, DNA and all of that kind of stuff. So to pretend like you were going to go into this to a degree that you guys are uh, really going to understand the ins and outs of this is, is uh, quite honestly ridiculous. Um, we're going to talk about this. You're, gonna, you're, you're not really even going to have very good working knowledge of, of DNA and RNA, but you're going to be familiar with it. You're going to go, hey, I've heard that talked about before. Um, so I'm not going to expect you to know um, a whole lot about these other than some a couple of basic things. Um, uh, these nucleic acids, of course, are built from nucleotides. No, I am not going to test you on what all of this is and all of those are, but those are the, the, the bases of those uh, nucleotides. Um, and, and that's kind of how the connection is made between the two. Two types, of DNA, two types of nucleic acids, one is DNA, we're very familiar with that. Watch an episode of NCIS or any cop movie um, and they will talk about DNA. I remember watching Hill Street Blues back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, early to mid 80s and they never hardly ever talked about DNA and if they did talk about DNA it was something that was just this new thing that was going on. You can't watch a, a, a cop show now without them talking about DNA because it's, a, it's very unique to each individual and it's, it's that genetic material that identifies who we are. Uh, it's only found within the cell's nucleus um, and it's the instruction book for every protein made in the body. Um, and the way that it's made up is this, uh, this stranded helix um, and you guys have probably all seen pictures of that. And of course, it talks about what it's uh, uh, what it's made up of. You know these things down here, um, but this is but it also is it replicates before cell division. So this DNA will duplicate itself when the cells divide. Okay, um, and this goes into the oh, there's a good one. computer generated image of DNA. Uh, amazing, amazing thing. Um, this is what it's talking about when it talks about that double helix. We, we see this side of it here, and we see this side of it here. It's a double helix, and these little guys connect only in certain patterns, meaning uh, you can see the shapes of these here, meaning they'll only connect one side to the other in the right pattern. Um, it's not important that you know what that pattern is. It's just important that you understand that this is always, A is always going to connect to T on this side, and if we've got a T, a will always connect to T on this side, and if we've got a T on this side, it's always going to connect to an A. It's, it's, that's just the way that it's going to be. Why that's important is, is because when this breaks apart and we're creating RNA, 
Basically, it carries out the DNA's instructions. It creates a template from the DNA um, of complementary bases, and what we're talking about are these complementary bases, this one sides of this. Um, it creates a template of that, and then it takes that message and transfers it out to create something. Um, so what it does is DNA, this, uh, this strand right here will split apart. This will split. It will open up. One, and one side of this will allow uh, it to transpose new information onto it. It'll create a strip of RNA. That RNA can then go out and create a protein from it. Okay. Um, ATP is also another nucleic acid. Um, it has a, a chemical energy that's used by all of the cells. Um, and basically the way that we release that energy is we break that phosphate bond like I talked about earlier. Um, it is replenished by the oxygenation of the foods and fuels that we eat. Um, we'll talk about that, how that happens later. And when we talk about the Krebs cycle, Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, citric acid cycle. Um, we'll talk about those more later. Um, uh, and and uh, hopefully you'll find that lecture pretty interesting. Okay, so let's see. We can see the ATP there. Um, and of course, when, uh, when that ATP loses one of the phosphate molecules, it becomes ADP. Um, and then what happens is, is the way uh, through a process through that Krebs cycle, through the cellular work at the Krebs level, it can convert that back to ATP um, and reset the mousetrap is what it's talking. We talked about this all earlier, okay? Um, ATP is, uh, is actually used up here. It's showing how it's used to unite a couple of compounds. Um, down here, it's used to pull something out of in, from inside of the cell to the outside. It's actually operating this little gizmo here, this little protein. Um, that's attached uh, to the cell membrane. And that little diagram that I showed you of the, the phospholipids, um, how they were opposing each other, um, here's an example of that right there. And that's this, this, is a, this is a microscopic view of a cell membrane right here. Um, and this is a little protein on that membrane. Um, and it's just it's getting rid of things that are inside of the cell that it doesn't want. It's using this ATP over here as the energy source to do it. Uh, and that's what it's doing. Um, it's also used to, for muscle contraction, and we'll talk about that in depth later. Okay, and that's it for this lesson. Um, those of you guys that endured, um, that have managed to endure the full two hours, um, I am a marathon lecturer. Um, I, don't, I don't usually break in between, uh, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, uh, also, it, I'm going to come back here. Uh, in, under that chapter two folder, you can see these, uh, um, these two videos here, um, and it won't let me write on it, otherwise I would. Um, but you can, you can see these two videos here, um, right? There's one and there, there's the other. Um, so watch those two videos. Um, uh, and here's the first one. It, it's the nonpolar molecules, uh, polar and nonpolar. So it talks about um, some of the, the ionic bonds and that kind of stuff, and that's what this one is too, chemical bonds and ionic bonds and those kinds of things. This guy here, I really like him. He's kind of fun to listen to. He's a lot more entertaining than me. Um, I No, I haven't taken lessons from him, so uh, I'll probably never be as creative as he is. Um, but this group right here, this um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It is There's actually a shortcut to this um under your, uh, I think it's course materials. Yeah, helpful links and places. Underneath there, there's this link to these crash course videos. Um, there's lots of videos there that are very helpful, um, and, and you can see them over here on this list. Um, feel free to watch these. Um, they're they're good. They kind of help. It's just another resource for for uh, kind of getting things in there. And I was actually going to try to play these um, during my lecture. But that would have just made things go about, about what, oh, a good 20 minutes or so longer. So I, lucky for you, I didn't torture you. I forgot about it. Um, oh, there was another one there I wanted to show you. Um, 
the other one is under helpful links and places is the khan academy video uh, khan academy videos um, a good set of videos you can go up here under subjects usually um, what, what you're going to look at is um, a lot of times it's either chemistry or um, uh, any ones of those so we see atoms and compounds um, and then uh, there's another one health and medicine I believe it is um, and under that one there you can see um, uh, we'll probably just want the anatomy and physiology one um, these um, Saul from Khan Academy he is he is much more wordy using a lot bigger words this is done at a much more advanced level um, but don't think, don't let that scare you off that it's in an advanced level. It's also very understandable. Um, but you can see all of these, uh, uh, the different systems and everything that they've got listed over here, you know, like the circulatory system. Um, you know, and these are all different lessons within that. Um, you know, Meet the Heart. We can watch that video series. Um, and, and, and I really like this that. picture that I found. Yeah. So Saul, he, he really likes the picture that he found there. So those are good resources, very helpful. Um, feel free to use them. Hopefully that helps. If you happen to find a new resource that you think is really good and worthwhile and beneficial, um, please do let me know. Send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. We'll just add it to our list. Um, I will see you guys on Chapter 3.